This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. The heart longing of every Christian for the last 2,000 years has been to see the Saviour return and set up an everlasting kingdom on earth. Events in the world reveal that this will happen very soon. Keep listening to learn how you can spiritually prepare for Earth's final events. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return. Hello, hello, welcome to World's Last Chance Radio. I'm your host, Miles Roby, and joining me is Dave Wright. Now, Dave, what have you prepared for us today? Well, do you know what an idiom is? Uh, yeah, well, yes, yeah, it's a phrase that uh, has a metaphorical meaning. You know, the literal meaning can be quite different, but everyone understands the metaphorical meaning. Well, hmm, I wouldn't actually say everyone understands the meaning uh, of an idiom. <laughs> uh, using <laughs> idioms, they, they can make you sound like a native speaker, but... They're a real challenge if you're not a native speaker. Which is very true. Hearing another language's idioms is always strange. Uh, For example, in Chinese, there's an idiom that means literally to spout smoke through seven orifices. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Hang on. uh, So what does that mean? Well, it's a phrase that means to be furious, you know? Ah, oh, I like that, actually. Yeah, it's very descriptive. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It, in fact, it's almost as descriptive as the German idiom, Leben wei die Mad im Speck. Now, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, but <laughs> it means literally, ready for this? To live like a maggot in bacon. Oh, gross. Gross. Ugh. So, so what's, what's the meaning behind that? Then? Well, it means basically to live luxuriously. We say oh. something like uh, like, a, like a bee in clover or something like that. Oh, got pig, you. Yeah. Pig in muck, as they say in Yorkshire. Yes, absolutely. Now, don't you ever wonder how some idioms came into existence? You know, the Swedish language has an idiom that literally means there's no cow on the ice. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Just means don't worry. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I suppose, yes, I can see that in Sweden having having a bovine on a frozen lake could be a bit of a problem. <laughs> right, yeah, it makes me wonder if there's a story behind that phrase, actually, or, or how this one from uh, from Spain. All right, you ready for this one? Go on, then. Da calabaze al gueni. Okay, very impressive. Say that again. Okay, well, no. Uh, <laughs> so I'll get slaughtered even from the first time I said that. Uh, I'm not even trying again. But literally it means to give pumpkins to someone. To give? What does that mean? <laughs> well, to give someone the brush off. I mean, to, re- to reject someone. Oh, I see. Right, yeah. okay. But, I mean, from having said what we've just said, you can see how idioms can create problems when you're trying to communicate across language barriers, can't you? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, one, of the, one of the funniest, I find, is the very British slang term, to bum a fag. Uh, now, to us, <laughs> to us people in England, it simply means to ask someone for a cigarette. However, however, Americans are always shocked to hear that phrase. It's more than a little risque to some Americans. I can tell you that for a start. <laughs> and that's within the same language as well, isn't it? Well, you can call it the same language. Some would and some wouldn't. Um, (laughs) You can see how there would be even more problems trying to communicate an idiom across language barriers. I mean, do you translate it as written, literally, or do you sort of translate the meaning? Mm. Well, unfortunately, Scripture itself is not free of idioms. and There's one that has caused some confusion, which I would like to talk about today. And what's that then, Dave? The idiom that the eye can be good or evil. Now, this is an idiom. There are a handful of Bible versions that translate the meaning, but most translations translate the idiom and the meaning is lost, which is just too bad. Yeah, I mean, it was my little sister as well, you know. How do you mean? Well, when when she was about five or six, I think she was, and I was about ten, well, old enough to, to know better, but young enough not to care, and I convinced her that she had evil eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Dare I ask, how did you do that? 
well, <clears throat> I kind of quoted scripture out of context, to be honest. Uh, you know how well that works. You can make scripture say anything you want if it's taken out of context. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. So mm. what did you actually say to her? Well, first I told her that Jesus said, if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. I let that sink in a little bit. And, and then I told her she didn't need to worry because Jesus had the cure, Matthew 18, verse 9. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Oh, you didn't, did you, Miles? That mm. is awful. And how, dare I ask, how did she react? Well, about what you'd expect. I, really, I, I didn't keep it going for too long, to be honest, though, uh, because mum came in to find out why my sister was so upset. Uh, and she made me apologise to her. And I admit, I, I've just been rather a, t a tasteless joke, you know? Big brothers, eh? What can I mm. say? All right, yeah. So since you say that that was an idiom in Hebrew, I'm assuming wherever the phrase appears in Scripture, we're not to take it literally, but... But what does it actually mean? Right, well, you've brought your big Bible in with you, I can see. So let's take a look at it. Um, well, we're going to take a look at a number of times that this idiom is actually used. So firstly, can you go to mm -hmm. Proverbs chapter 28 and read yep. for us verse 22? And what does it say there? Well, it says, He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. Yeah, and which version is that? Uh, it's King James. Okay, so that's a good place to start, actually. The translators of the King James Version translated the idiom, but not the meaning. Now, mm. actually, I've brought in, as you can see, several different translations today. Yeah. Um, why don't you just try try this one here? Now, this is okay. the uh, let me just this is called the Modern English Version. Um, yeah. And what does it say? Uh, well, it says down here on your marker. He who hastens to be rich has an evil eye and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. Okay, so another use of idiom. Now, that surprises me, actually. So let's try this one. This is the New International Version. Okay, thank you. Uh, it says, The stingy are eager to get rich and are unaware that poverty awaits them. There it is, the stingy. Mm. Saying someone has an evil eye was a Hebrew idiom for being stingy. Okay, right. let's take a look at some more of these. Let's go to uh, Proverbs chapter 22, and can you read verse 9? Uh, which, which version? I've got plenty well, in front of me. Yeah, just let's do the King James Version again. Okay, over here. Um, so just to remind you, it's Proverbs chapter 22 and yeah. verse 9. Okay. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. Now that's the idiom. He that has a bountiful eye shall be blessed. Now... On that theme, what does the NIV, the New International Version, say? The NIV says, uh, says, The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. So we've seen both uses of the idiom here. Someone mm. who has an evil eye is stingy, even miserly. Pecunious. Right, yes, exactly. Someone, on the other hand, that has a good or bountiful eye is someone who is generous. Right, this next text, could you read in the modern English version? Uh, okay. It's Proverbs 23, verses 5 to 8. And what does yes. that say? Uh, it says, just one second, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, chapter 23, verses what? Sorry. Uh, 5 to 8. Okay. Will you set your eye on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Do not eat the bread of him who has an evil eye, neither desire his delicacies. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. The morsel you have eaten you will vomit up and lose your sweet words. And the uh, New International Version? Just one more. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Do not eat the food of a begrudging host. Do not crave his delicacies, for he is the kind of person who is always thinking about the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the little you have eaten and will have wasted your compliments. So the idiom says, do not eat the food of a man with an evil eye. The actual meaning is, 
don't receive anything from someone who begrudges giving it to you. The point that Scripture is trying to make is that Yah's people are to be generous. We're not so caught up in getting ahead that we are miserly with heaven's gifts. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. This is Christ's Sermon on the Mount, and here he reveals what Yahweh is like, telling his listeners that just as Yahweh is generous, so are his followers to be. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48, please, Miles. Okay. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. This is a beautiful revelation of the inner heart of Yah. He wishes well on his friends and enemies alike. He doesn't hold grudges. He wants everyone to be prosperous and happy. And if we want to be like him, we will be too. Yahuwah planned generosity into the Hebrew economy. Every seven years there was a sabbatical when the land was to rest. Then every seventh cycle of seven years was the year of jubilee, when land that had been leased out would return to its original owners and indentured slaves would be set free. Let's take a moment to read that, actually. I think um, it would have uh, more of a meaning if someone uh, hasn't read it before. To oh, yeah, OK, good point. Um, well, it's Leviticus chapter 25, I think. OK, right. Uh, verses 1 to 17, it says, And Yahweh spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to Yahweh. Six years you shall sow your field and six years you shall prune your vineyard, and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to Yahuwah. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. What grows of its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine. For it is a year of rest for the land, and the Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you. For you, your male and female servants, your hired men, and the stranger who dwells with you. Notice that even the stranger among them was to be dealt with generously. In many first world countries, there's often resentment against immigrants from third world countries, but that is an unscriptural attitude. We are to be as kind and generous to the stranger amongst us as we are to our own. I think churches do this too, don't they, sometimes? When I was a kid, um, there was some natural disaster. I forget what it was, but I, I do remember hearing on the news how this one particular denomination would send people around, and the first thing they asked was if the family affected by the natural disaster was a member of their church or not. Uh, if the people were members of the church, they'd help them. If not, they'd go on. Mm. And You see, even as a kid, I was quite shocked by that. When I asked my mum about it, she said that particular denomination was known for helping only their own. Yeah, it's not what Scripture teaches that we're to do, is it? No, oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, and the Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you, for you, your male and female servants, your hired man, and the stranger who dwells with you. Okay. For your livestock and the beasts that are in your land, all its produce shall be for food. And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times, seven years. And the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you forty-nine years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. And you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. 
that fiftieth year, shall be a jubilee to you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of its own accord, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it is the jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat its produce from the field. In this year of jubilee, each of you shall return to his possession. And if you sell anything to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor's hand, you shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the jubilee, you shall buy from your neighbor, and according to the number of years of crops, he shall sell to you. According to the multitude of years, you shall increase its price. And according to the fewer number of years, you shall diminish its price. For he sells to you according to the number of the years of the crops. Therefore, you shall not oppress one another. You shall fear your God, for I am Yahuwah, your God. So this is how Yah's people are to act, like him, generous in all things. Now, Miles, could you turn to Matthew chapter 6? Now that we've got an understanding of this idiom, let's read the passage that you use to torment your little sister. Mm. <laughs> I think it will have a whole lot more meaning now that we understand what was meant by the phrase. So it's Matthew okay. chapter 6, verses... Um, well, let's start at verses 22 and 23. I know, well... <laughs> The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Christ is saying here that if we are generous, we will be blessed. However, if we are stingy, miserly, if we're pecunious, clinging to what we have without a thought to others in need, then our eye is bad. A stingy, greedy, miserly attitude will impact our entire body. In other words, it will negatively impact our spiritual life. Have you ever felt discouraged? Because it seems that no matter how hard you try, no matter how deeply you repent, no matter how much you long to be like Yahweh, you still stumble and fall into sin again. And yet again, and still again, many Christians get discouraged over this seemingly endless cycle and adopt the unbiblical belief that it doesn't matter anyway because, they say, we're no longer under the law, we're under grace now. Other believers get so discouraged and embarrassed that they try all the harder in their own strength to resist temptation feeling that if they can somehow prove their sincerity by resisting temptation, they can approach Yah to ask for forgiveness. If you find yourself sinning again and again, if you're feeling hopeless and too embarrassed to ask the Father to forgive you yet again, take courage. There is a very simple explanation for the problem of ongoing sin, and that is found in a clear understanding of the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant is much more than an outdated agreement between Yahuwah and ancient Israel. It has a special work to do in the hearts of believers today. To learn more, look for the article The Good News About the Old Covenant on our website. You can also look for the radio programme titled The Divine Solution for Believers Trapped in Sin. Yah knows we are unable to keep his law and he's got it all under control. Once again, that's the divine solution for believers trapped in sin. You can listen to it on worldslastchance.com or look for it on YouTube. I'm, I'm really curious what you mean by having an evil eye, a, a stingy, miserly attitude will impact our spiritual life. Well, it has to do with faith and trust. We recently did a program, you'll remember, entitled Radical Faith and the Gift of Giving. In it, we talked about how the Hebrews and even the earliest Christians viewed generous giving as an act of worship. Right, yeah, I, I remember that, actually. It's a really interesting perspective. And if any of our listeners miss that one, you can still listen to it on worldslastchance.com or our channel on YouTube. Again, it, that's Radical Faith and the Gift of Giving. If you truly believe that Yahuwah will reward you for your generosity, you won't worry about whether or not you should give because you know that Yahuwah will provide for you. Yeah, absolutely. Proverbs 19 verse 17. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to Yahuwah, 
and he will reward them for what they have done. Yeah, exactly. Now, you can't outgive Yah. We are to reveal Yah's generosity to us in how we treat others. This is having a good eye, and it will impact our body, our spiritual life, because it will increase our faith in Yah to provide for us. We don't have to cling to things, having an evil eye. Instead, our faith will grow, and so will our spirituality, as we experience Yahuwah providing for our needs. In our last segment, you said something about Yahuwah planning generosity into the Hebrew economy. So what, what did you mean by that, Dave? Okay, well, let's take a look at it. Let's go back to Deuteronomy. It's Deuteronomy chapter 15, and we're mm-hmm. going to read through from verses 7 through to 11. And you'll notice a caution in this passage not to have an evil eye, not to be greedy or stingy. Okay? Yeah, okay. It says, If there is among you a poor man of your brethren within any of the gates in your land which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you, You shall not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor brother. But you shall open your hand wide to him, and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. Beware lest there be a wicked thought in your heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing. And he cry out to Yahuwah against you, and it become a sin among you. You shall surely give to him, and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him. Because for this thing, Yahuwah your God will bless you in all your works and in all to which you put your hand. For the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore I command you, saying, You shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land. Giving to those less fortunate are what we are called to do as believers. We trust that Yahweh will provide for our needs and we do not turn our back on someone in need. We, you and I, are Yah's designated means to help those in need of help in our circle of influence. And this has been true from the very beginning. Abraham was a wealthy man, but unlike the so-called robber barons of the 19th century, he didn't gain his wealth by cheating others. He knew he was a representative of the Most High God and he acted like it. Grab that, uh, that yes, that brown book there, Miles. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh huh. Yep, the book of Yasher. Yes, Yasher is referred to several times in Scripture, and for good reason. It doesn't contradict Scripture, but it does give a more detailed account than contained in the books of Moses. Let's just read what it says about Abraham. Uh, sure. You need to go to Yasher chapter twenty-two and read verses. Um, now let, let me see. Uh, verses eleven through to thirteen. Okay, no problem. Just one second. And it says here, And Abraham planted a large grove in Beersheba, and he made it to four gates facing the four sides of the earth, and he planted a vineyard in it, so that if a traveller came to Abraham, he entered any gate which was in his road, and remained there, and ate and drank, and satisfied himself, and then departed. For the house of Abraham was always open to the sons of men that passed and repassed, who came daily to eat and drink in the house of Abraham. And any man who had hunger and came to Abraham's house, Abraham would give him bread that he might eat and drink and be satisfied. And any one that came naked to his house, he would clothe with garments as he might choose and give him silver and gold and make known to him the Lord who had created him in the earth. This did Abraham all his life. This is how Abraham lived out his faith. He was generous and kind. He gave freely to those in need. Isaiah chapter 41 and James chapter 2 both refer to Abraham as a friend of Yah. That's beautiful, it really is. And to be known as a personal friend of Yah? I mean, you couldn't ask for more than that, could you, really? Abraham sought to reflect Yahweh in all his dealings with his fellow man, and one way that he did that was by having a good eye. He was generous. He had been blessed with material wealth, and he used that material wealth to bless others. He wasn't stingy. He didn't have an evil eye. Instead, he passed on the blessings he'd received. So it's, it's not a sin to be wealthy then? No, of course not. But no, why would you ask? Well, I'm thinking of Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 24, that says, quote, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve Yah and Mammon, unquote. So mammon, of course, is the Aramaic word for riches, uh, you know, wealth. 
All right, so let me ask you this. When Abraham had his workmen plant a vineyard at his expense, when he opened his home to travellers and gave them food, clothing and money, was he serving riches? Was his eye evil? Uh, well, no, 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 no. To use a biblical idiom, I'd say his eye was good. He was, he was very generous. And the same with Job and others. What about Dorcas in the New Testament? She bought or made cloth and then made clothes which she gave away to the poor. Lydia, a wealthy seller of purple, opened her home to Paul, Silas and Luke, feeding them and housing them during their stay in her city. These are all people who used their wealth to bless others. Let's look at another example. Just grab one of those Bibles that you've got there, Miles. Okay. And um, let's go to Luke chapter 14. Here, Yahushua was invited to a meal in the home of one of the rulers of the Pharisees. You know, he would have been very wealthy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he was a ruler of the ruling class. So Yahushua was sitting there. And as he's sitting there, some other guest pompously declares, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. <laughs> I can just see it now. He's likely another Pharisee, probably wealthy as well, and thinks he's going to educate his itinerant preacher. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, and people are still people, they mm. equate worth with wealth. Well, Yahushua saw an opening to teach what was truly important and what attitude would prepare someone to eat bread in the kingdom of Yah. So he tells a parable to this guy. So go ahead, Miles, can you read it? It's verses 16 through to 24. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. The servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. This is how a true believer will use his wealth to bless, to help others in need with no expectation of return. The man's friends were likely wealthy too. They could easily have reciprocated his invitation, but the poor, the maimed, the lame and the blind couldn't. Even if a day labourer, someone found in the highways or the hedges that had been compelled to come in, even if such a person invited the wealthy man to his house, the quality of food and entertainment wouldn't be on a par with that what the wealthy man could provide. But the wealthy man wasn't worried about that. He prepared a feast and he wanted others to enjoy it with him. He wasn't worried about paybacks. Mm, that's the true test of generosity, isn't it? Giving with no expectation of return and... There are needy people all around us. And the need isn't always financial, of course. Maybe an elderly man needs help with transportation to his doctor's appointments. Maybe a single mother is struggling to pay winter heating bills. Oh, or her kids could benefit from having a man take an interest in them and be a positive, godly role model in their lives. Yes, there are multitudes of ways to help those around us if it is in the heart to give. A truly wise person will realise that monetary wealth is fleeting. True wealth is that which we store up in heaven. Mm. Circling back to your comment about Yahuwah planning generosity into the Hebrew economy, are there any other examples of that which we could learn from today? Yes, absolutely there are. And the most common place to find references to this is in the book of Deuteronomy. This laid the foundation for the entire Israelite culture. And we've already read in Deuteronomy 15 where Yahuwah told the Israelites not to let their eye be evil against their brother in need, but to be generous. So let's read now the verses just before that. So it's Deuteronomy 15, verses 1 to 6. Okay. It says, At the end of every seven years you shall grant a release of debts, and this is the form of the release. 
Every creditor who has lent anything to his neighbour shall release it. He shall not require it of his neighbour or his brother, because it is called Yahuwah release. Of a foreigner you may require it, but you shall give up your claim to what is owed by your brother, except when there may be no poor among you. For Yahuwah will greatly bless you in the land which Yahuwah your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance. Only if you carefully obey the voice of Yahuwah your God to observe with care all these commandments which I command you today. For Yahuwah your God will bless you just as he promised you. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You shall reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over you. This is the crux. Faithfully serve Yahuwah and he in turn will bless you. You don't need to be greedy. You don't need to have an evil eye because Yahuwah will provide for you as you provide for those in need within your sphere of influence. One of the ways that this was done was through hospitality. Let's go to the next chapter there, Deuteronomy chapter 16. Here it's talking about the various feasts of Yahuwah. These, as we know from Scripture, will continue to be celebrated in the new earth. Okay. Uh, well, and, and even now it's a privilege to celebrate them, isn't it? I mean, these are important anniversaries in salvation history. They're not part of the ordinances that govern blood sacrifice, so they weren't fulfilled at the cross. Exactly right. So it starts out on verse 1, explaining how to keep the Feast of Passover. Uh, now just drop down to verses 10 to 12. Mm-hmm. Then you shall keep the Feast of Weeks to Yahuwah, your Elohim, with the tribute of a free will offering from your hand, which you shall give as Yahuwah, your Elohim, blesses you. You shall rejoice before Yahuwah, your Elohim, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your gates, the stranger and the fatherless, and the widow who are among you, at the place where Yahuwah, your Elohim, chooses to make his name abide. They weren't to celebrate with just their kith and kin. They were to include the Levite that was within their gates and even the stranger the fatherless and the widow who may not have had any immediate connection but might not have had the money to celebrate and would enjoy an invitation. Uh, verse 12. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. This is why they were to be generous. They had been slaves in Egypt, brought forth by Yah's generous, loving concern for them. The same holds true for us. We've been enslaved to sin. We have nothing with which to recommend ourselves to Yah, but despite that, he graciously extended the invitation to salvation to us. He invites us to become members of his family and live forever with him. He even invites us to live in his house? I mean, you know that promise in John 14. In my father's house are many mansions. It's actually, in my father's house are many rooms or dwelling places. We're invited to live with him. Live with him. Honestly, talk about hospitality. You can't get more generous than that. No, no, you really can't. And just as we have received life, support, healing, care, and so much more, we are called to give those same blessings to others. While we can't give life, literally, we can certainly provide for those in need. That is having a good eye, a generous spirit. It's that which reflects Yah's image, because that's what he's done for us. Mm. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Yes, the words of Christ in sending out the disciples. Yes, just as we've been the recipient of generous blessings, we are to have a good eye, a generous spirit in giving to others. And Yahuwah accepts as done to himself what is done to others. He will repay what is given. So you can't outgive Yah. <laughs> really, you can't, no. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 93.30 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Wise parents know that the key to raising kids who are grateful rather than entitled is to teach children to express appreciation as well as provide them with opportunities to give. It may seem awkward to give your child money so she can buy you a birthday present, 
But the life lessons gained when your child learns the joy of giving are invaluable. The same holds true when we give to our Heavenly Father. Let's face it, Yahuwa doesn't actually need anything we can give him. However, as a wise and loving father, Yah understands that we need to give. When we learn to give, as it is our privilege to do, rich rewards await. The ancient Israelites and even the early Christians viewed giving to the needy as an act of worship. But there's more. Giving to others actually reveals the level of faith we have in Yah to provide for us. To learn more, look for the article The Rich Rewards of Radical Faith on our website. You can also look for the WLC radio program titled Radical Faith and the Gift of Giving. That's Radical Faith and the Gift of Giving on worldslastchance.com. Past radio programs can also be heard on YouTube. Today's question from our daily mailbag is coming from Florida in the United States. Hey, I've j- actually, I've just learned something interesting about Florida. Oh, yeah. You know, I'll have my, my interesting facts. It has a park called the Everglades National Park. Yes, yes, I've heard of it. it isn't it some like some great big swamp or something? Yeah, well, it's, it's actually tropical wetlands. It's also a World Heritage Site because so many rare and endangered species live there. Uh, but what I found so fascinating is that the only ecosystem, it's the only ecosystem in the world where both alligators and crocodiles, they coexist together. Huh. Never knew such a thing was possible. <laughs> that mm. strikes me as being quite strange, actually. I wonder if they ever get into fights. Well, and which one wins if they do? <laughs> yes. Yes. I tried to think. Uh, mm. Very strange. So what is our question from Florida? Well, Jennifer Hartman writes... My sister's kids came to live with us last summer after the tragic loss of their parents. It was a horrible experience and we're all struggling to find a new normal. My nephews are 12 and 14. They're good kids, but my husband and I don't have any experience with this age range as our own children are still very young. So my question is, what are some challenges facing young people today that we should keep in mind whilst jumping into parenting teenagers? Well, what a great question. Times are different. The world that teens are facing today is very different that we face as young people. There are some unique challenges that godly parents should keep in mind in today's world, especially those who are raising teenagers. Now, what I would say is that one of the most obvious is that unless you're living in an extremely rare environment, most youth today are living in an anti-Christian environment. And I'm not just talking about listeners who live in countries that are predominantly Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim. What I'm talking about is an environment that is opposed to biblical standards of Christianity. Yeah, I mean, that's everywhere, isn't it? A secular mindset, not valuing what scripture values. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's something we all have to deal with in fact, on a daily basis. Parents of youth need to be aware of just how much influence the media has on young people. One of the saddest stories I ever read was actually about a 15-year-old girl driven to suicide by the bullying she received on social media. Yeah, and social media can be very unhealthy for adults, let alone for kids. And I'm not saying that kids should never be allowed on social media, but that's one area that parents today should keep a close eye on. And not just on the so-called social media, but actually media in general. What values is it passing on to our youth? Yeah, I mean, one big example would be movies in general teach violence and sexual promiscuity. Exactly right, yes. And the media can also exacerbate any problem a kid might have with his or her self-image. Isn't that the truth? I mean, you don't get a a healthy self-image from the media at all. Everyone focuses on this point a lot as it relates to young girls, but the truth is it could be negatively impacting on young boys as well. If they don't have the ripped muscles of the latest Hollywood box office star, I mean, you know, that that kind of thing. And, And this all contributes to another thing parents of teens should watch out for, and that is materialism. Well... Everyone needs to watch out for that, to be honest. Uh, But yeah, I mean, peer pressure could be especially intense during the teen years uh, when you're still trying to figure out who you want to be in life. And the latest styles, the latest movie releases, what are the kids are focused on in order to fit in? 
it can all take your focus away from what's really important in life. Yes, which in turn can make it difficult for young people to personalise and live out their faith. Surrounding our young people with a loving, supportive faith community can really help here. When they see other people they respect, people who are kind, compassionate, fun to be around, the Christian walk shouldn't be some onerous slog through life. Then they will be shown through example what the Christian life is really like. They will build attachments and bonds to other Christians so that worldly attachments will have less influence. Notice you said less influence. Yes, a lot of parents try to protect their kids by trying to remove them from the world. Now, I believe that that is a mistake. We are not called to shun unbelievers. Rather, we're to be like Christ. And what was Christ like? He wasn't like how he is too often portrayed in movies. <laughs> Helmet hair and too holy to be human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, yes. Rather, the Saviour was kind, accepting and friendly to everyone. He was friendly to all. I think he was actually quite charismatic in the best sense of the word. He appealed to people because of his personal charm. Well, obviously not everybody, not those who hated his teachings, but he was friendly to everyone. Unlike many Christians today, he didn't hold himself aloof from those who didn't believe the way he did. He was kind and accepting to all, non-judgmental. Yeah, that's how you draw people to the yard. Too often, though, parents will wrap their kids in cotton wool, metaphorically speaking, mm. as though if they can just remove worldly influences from their kids, the youth will stay faithful to Yah. Now, this becomes a problem, though, because when the young people grow up and gain some independence, they discover that not every unbeliever is the devil in disguise. Unbelievers can be kind, friendly, interesting people, too. Yeah, they can become dazzled by what the world has to offer. Is, is that what you're saying? I've seen it happen, yes. Look, we're in the world. We're not to be of the world, but we are in the world. And the best thing that you can do for your kids is, number one, live a life that is consistent with what you teach them. Don't be a hypocrite saying, do as I say, not as I do. Secondly, fill their lives as much as you can with other believers that they can respect and look up to, to see that it's not just mum and dad saying these things. There are others too who love Yah and live devoted Christian lives, people they like and can admire. And this becomes more important when kids reach the teen years. I think another thing that parents of teens need to guard against is making sure that the kids' lives aren't so full, that there's no time for a devotional life. So many youth get involved with jobs, lessons, sports, and there's nothing wrong with that. But in addition to school, they're rushing here, and they're rushing there, and they're exhausted and distracted, and there's no time to just, you know, be... And, and know that he is Yah. You know what I mean, Dave? I do, exactly. I know exactly where you're coming from with that. And that's a lesson that can be taken into adulthood, actually, as well. Always make sure to slow down enough to have enough meaningful time with Yah. And one last thing, discipline. Now, this doesn't mean spanking. In fact, there are plenty of countries where corporal punishment is actually illegal. Yeah, it's going to be especially challenging for Jennifer as these aren't even her own sons, but her grieving nephews. But you see, discipline doesn't necessarily mean punishment. Self-discipline, sticking at a task until you finish it, exercising self-control when you're angry rather than blowing up and yelling or hitting, all of these are very important life lessons that you need for adulthood. That's true, but let's let's talk about punishment then for a moment, which we've just touched on. Obviously, kids aren't perfect, so if they do do something wrong, how, how do you punish a teenager? Well, first, I would never punish for an accident or an honest mistake. Ever? Well, ever. Think about it. You're God to your kids. The way you show compassion and understanding, or the way you let rip or tear them a new one when they make a mistake teaches them what to expect of their heavenly father when they make a mistake. Yeah, it's very true. Wish my own father would have known that, to be honest. Now, deliberately doing what you've been told not to do, on the other hand, is something else entirely, and teens can certainly learn consequences, cause and effect, but always with patience, love, and respect for them as younger members of the heavenly family, because that's what they are. Okay, well, we've got time for just one more question, I think, but um, I'm going to have to keep your answer rather shortish on this one. Okay, got it. So what's the question? Jet from St. Paul, Minnesota, wants to know what's a principle every Christian should always remember? 
Okay, well, off the cuff, I'd say Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7 sums it up well. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. This is a powerful psychological fact. By beholding, we become changed. So we all need to ask ourselves, what am I beholding? What am I focusing on? What thoughts hold my interest and take up my time? If they're thoughts of worldly things, we will quickly lose our appetite for spiritual things. Isn't that the truth? The more I submerge myself in Scripture, honestly, the more I want to. The less time I spend in Yah's Word, the less I enjoy it. Yep, and that's how it is with all of us. So being mindful of what occupies our thoughts, the latest celebrity gossip, the plot line of the latest movie, or gratitude to Yah for his many blessings, meditating on passages of Scripture, these not only reveal where our heart is, but they also form our character to be saved or to be lost. That's so true. It really is. Uh, thank you for keeping it short. It's uh, all we've got time for today, but please keep sending your questions in and your comments as well. Just go to worldslastchance.com and click on Contact Us. We always enjoy hearing from our listeners. Hello, this is Jane Lamb with today's Daily Promise from Yah's Word. Can you imagine what it would be like to live where everyone else could communicate with each other, but not with you? How would it make you feel? Lonely? Detached from everyone else? Disconnected from the world around you? Well, that was the experience of one hearing-impaired man by the name of Maharem, who lived in a suburban area of Istanbul in Turkey. Unbeknownst to Meharem, tech giant Samsung was wanting to launch their new video call centre for the hearing impaired. Meharem's sister, Oslem, and dozens of individuals in their local community worked hard together for weeks, so that wherever Meharem went, people could communicate with him in sign language. It was a set-up, of course but a setup of the very best kind. From the man who offered Meharem an apple as a thank you for helping him pick up the fruit he dropped, to the woman who accidentally bumped into him, to the taxi driver and more. Everywhere Meharem went, people greeted him and communicated with him in sign language. At the town square, when Meharem learned of all the hard work and planning that had gone into the experience, he was overcome with emotion. For the first time in his life, he felt part of his community, rather than an outside observer. Psalm 32 verse 11 says, The plans of Yahweh stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. And what are those plans? Jeremiah 29 tells us, verses 11 to 13 state, for I know the plans I have for you, declares Yahweh. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. The plans of the Father's heart are for our good. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to experience joy and find satisfaction even in this life. Isaiah 55 says, quote, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says Yahweh. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Yah's greatest desire for you is your happiness. Every plan he makes is to this one end. Numbers 23 verse 19 assures us, quote, Eloha is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfil? 
You can trust that Yahweh loves you and that he always keeps his promises. We have been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. You know, just now, as as Jane was sharing today's daily promise, I was thinking of what you shared earlier about if our eye is good or generous, our whole body will be full of light. So, in other words, when we are generous, it has a positive impact on our spiritual life. That's a really important experience to have in order to get through the days ahead. It really is, Miles, yes. Like you said, it's important for the days ahead, but it's just as important now. Everywhere you go, everywhere you look, the intensity is increasing. We are even now being faced with decisions that require divine guidance. We need light, divine light, both for the days ahead as well as the increasing number of issues that face us now. Another thing is that both faith and generosity, or the lack thereof, is both a choice and a habit. If we choose to make it a habit to be generous now then that lays a strong foundation so we'll continue to be generous in the days ahead. Now, if we're generous even when we're struggling financially now, we're more likely to be generous with those in need when we can't buy or sell when the mark of the beast is enforced, as foretold in Revelation 13. It's important to make it a habit now to trust in Yah to provide for our needs. If we do, we'll begin having experiences that strengthen our faith, proving that Yah does indeed provide for his children, and that's the kind of experience we need for the days ahead. And to put it more clearly, being generous, having a good eye, increases our faith as we, in our own lives, have experiences where Yah blessed us and provided for our needs. I remember hearing of this contest a magazine ran a couple of years ago now. The contest was to come up with the best definition of true poverty. They promised to give $1,000 to whoever would come up with the best definition. Hmm, That's an interesting competition. It is, isn't it? Well, I, I think they were wanting to make a point about true poverty or what true poverty is versus what some people think it is. It's not being unable to buy the latest style of shoes or whatever, you know, so, that kind of thing. Yeah, so what was the winning definition? Well, an elderly retired school teacher actually won. And she said, true poverty is when you are so poor that you have nothing left to give to someone else. Interesting, yes. That's actually mm. very insightful, isn't it? If you don't have money to give, you can give aid in other ways. You can even give a listening ear, an encouraging smile. All of which comes back to bless the giver, filling our body with light. And the true beautiful thing is, as we allow the spirit of Yah to develop these godly traits in our character, we will end up receiving even more blessings than we are giving. Mm. Generosity and faith, they go hand in hand, you know. Yeah. Both will grow exponentially when allowed to do so. It has a rebound effect, doesn't it, Dave? It does, yes. And it's not just temporally, but spiritually as well, which is the most important. There's one last passage I'd like to turn to. Could we go to Luke okay. chapter 6? And we'd yeah. like to read verses 37 and 38. Here, Christ is laying out the attitude that we are to take when we have a good eye and what the rewards will be when we're metaphorically filled with light. It's Luke chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use it will be measured back to you. Notice this is more than generosity with money. This is generosity of spirit. Giving someone else the benefit of the doubt, withholding judgment, bestowing compassion and understanding. When we do this, we will receive the same in return because with the same measure by which we judge others, 
we will be judged in return. If we are generous and kind in our attitudes and dealings with others, that same kindness and generosity will be returned to us. What a beautiful interchange as well. There are such beautiful blessings bestowed when we seek Yah and do things His way. We hope you can join us again tomorrow. And until then, remember, Yahuwah loves you and He is safe to trust. Are you facing a situation where you need divine help and guidance? There is power in prayer. Yahuwah is just longing to answer the prayer of faith. If you would like others to join with you in prayer, visit our website and click on Prayer Requests. The WLC team prays over the prayer list each day, and others around the world can join with you in seeking the Father's face. Remember, prayer moves the arm of omnipotence. Let us join you in prayer at worldslastchance.com. listening to WLC Radio. World's Last Chance is committed to bringing the gospel of the Kingdom of Yah to the world. Prophecy and current events indicate the Saviour will return in the very near future. This will be followed by gifting the saints with immortality and setting up Yah's kingdom here on earth. There's no time to waste. Accept the gift of salvation today and allow Yahweh to cover you with the righteousness of Christ. This programme, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available on our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the homepage. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 metre band. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return.